There are two good things about this week's Raw. Two, two, two good things and nothing more. Number one, it seemed like they touched on just about everything that needed to be touched on um, for Fastlane on Sunday. It was like they were actually trying to finalize the card, set things into motion. And so often the case in recent years where we've seen the WWE throw one, two, three random ass matches onto the card at the last minute, at least they seem to be trying to build up some type of card here, you know, actually give you what looks like to be a full card so you can make some type of determination in terms of expectations for the show. They weren't that lazy in terms of trying to throw randomly thrown together things at the last minute that really don't belong in a pay-per-view at all. The second good thing is that the show's done. That's it. This week's Raw stunk. And it didn't just stink from an entertainment value, um, even though it clearly did, because this show was really, really lacking in it. To me, I just don't know what the WWE is trying to accomplish here. I don't understand what the hell they're doing. It's like a rudderless ship right now. A lot of nonsensical storytelling, piss-poor character development, turns of characters that don't really work, and, you know, just a lot of 50-50 counterproductive bullshit. You know, stuff we've grown accustomed to out of this company in recent years. Now, I'll start off with this. I understand that for many of you, you believe in God. And you know God to be real. You have that belief. You have that faith. And it's not something to be questioned. He's not somebody you have to see because you feel it. You hear him. You know it. Well, by God, when it comes to the WWE, there is but one God and one God alone. And in this particular case, the mortals every once in a while too would like to see their God, the King of Kings, the game, the cerebral assassin, the blue-blooded son of a gun from Greenwich, Connecticut himself, Hunter Hearst Townley, every once in a while, we'd like some visu visual validation, excuse me, that God is real and that God exists, especially considering he is the WWE World Heavyweight Champion. I understand he's not working fast lane in a match, but he is your top guy. He is your World Heavyweight Champion right now. It'd be nice to have seen him a little bit more in the build-up from Rumble to fast lane because... Everything you've been doing since Survivor Series has been about God's WrestleMania match. Why in the fuck would you back off of that now? When it's still ultimately about God's WrestleMania match. It's, it's ridiculous. I don't know who the hell decided that God didn't need to show. We need God and we need to see him. Hopefully that means he's going to get pounded down our throats on the road to WrestleMania because they're going to have to overcompensate for the piss-poor job they've done with him, booking-wise, since the Royal Rumble. And then we get to the whole triple threat that's going to take place on Sunday between Brock Lesnar and Dean Ambrose and Roman Reigns. And just so many things about this just reek of stupidity. Here's what I don't understand. Stephanie Hunter seemed to be so concerned with Dean Ambrose and Roman Reigns. They are so concerned, again, I mentioned, I emphasize, with Dean Ambrose and Roman Reigns. To the point where they completely forget that of all people, the third guy in this match is Brock fucking Lesnar. The guy who once broke God's arm. The guy who once beat God two out of three times. The same guy that ended The Undertaker's undefeated streak at WrestleMania 30. The same guy that obliterated and destroyed John Cena with 16 suplexes at freaking SummerSlam 2014. This same monster. The Beast Incarnate. Suplex City, bitch. We let him skate off scot-free. Now, if we're handicapping this thing and put aside personal biases or fandom or anything else, just from a, a pure presentation standpoint, you got these three jokers standing next to each other. Who are you going to assume is threat number one? It's going to be Brock Lesnar. Threat number two is going to be Roman Reigns. Threat number three is Dean Ambrose. You will say, well, that's just a size thing. Yeah, size does matter. It's not just about the motion in the ocean. It's about the fucking sides. Can you hit the bottom of a fucking boat? Well, in this particular case here, Brock Lesnar is the beast incarnate. If I'm worried about anybody at Fastlane, and if I want to make sure that anybody out of the three is the least likely to be going on to face me for my title at WrestleMania 32, I want to do anything and everything that I possibly can to take Brock Lesnar completely out of the fucking equation. Instead, the WWE has done everything that they can 
to protect Brock Lesnar when he doesn't need to be protected because, again, it doesn't make any storyline sense. Furthermore, they run into the issue where you keep building up Brock Lesnar. He's already a beast. He's already a monster. You got to give Reigns and Ambrose something. You got to give them a shining moment, and you just haven't done that. You're building up Lesnar into too much of a monster to where it's too unbelievable that anybody on the fucking roster can beat him. See John Cena. Well, now you got fucking Brock Lesnar, the guy who smashed John Cena, and he's smashing everybody else. And even when these assholes are jumping on him two-on-one, -on -one, at the end of the day, Brock Lesnar still reigns and rules supreme. And if I'm the guy with the title, and I want the easiest path to retention after WrestleMania 32, I'm going to do everything I can to take care of this freaking flat-topped meathead from the fucking Minnesota area. I'm not worried about this Samoan from Pensacola, Florida. I'm not worried about Dean fucking Ambrose. The first guy I want to take care of is Brock Lesnar. And instead they worry about everybody other than Brock Lesnar. And then the whole shit with Dean Ambrose and Roman Reigns. And Dean, oh, he almost got him. He almost got him. Ah. I get that you're trying to build up tension between those two. And that's fine. That's one part of it. I get that you're trying to spotlight Ambrose and make him a more featured part of this. And again, that's fine. But it's like they've almost kind of forgotten Roman Reigns, which is particularly ridiculous, especially since most of us believe at this particular moment in time still that Roman Reigns will be the one to win that match and then go on to face God at WrestleMania 32. Operating under that assumption, it makes no sense that Roman Reigns has taken such a back seat here. And furthermore, it makes even less sense that Brock Lesnar's gotten off pr particularly pretty much scot-free. So we're punishing Ambrose by having him defend his IC title in a fatal five-way. To where he's not even really a factor, he's not really involved. And we have fucking Kevin Owens pin Tyler Breeze. What the fuck are we doing? Why go through all that exercise of a feud between Ambrose and Owens for the IC title just for Ambrose to get the strap from Owens just to sit here right now at the Monday before Fastlane to have Kevin fucking Owens win the goddamn title, meaning he has absolutely no momentum whatsoever heading into the show this Sunday? This is this 50-50 booking that makes absolutely no fucking sense. You have the guy lose the title just so that way a month or two later he can come right back and fucking win it with no real payoff to it, no real consequence, no real purpose for it happening. And then on top of that, we're going to decide that we want to send fucking Dolph Ziggler at him. Dolph fucking Ziggler! <laughs> Fuck Dolph Ziggler! Dolph fucking Ziggler! This is the ridiculousness of this company. You had Dolph Ziggler beat Kevin Owens the past couple of weeks after Kevin Owens had beat him so many other goddamn times. Now in this match, it's Kevin Owens that wins the IC title, so that way Dolph Ziggler could come challenge him? <laughs> fuck Dolph Ziggler! Who wants to see this shit? Who gives a fuck about Dolph Ziggler anymore? And we're going to start getting to the point, frankly, who gives a fuck about Kevin Owens? When you do this 50-50 half-ass booking, nobody gets over. Nobody shines. And yet this stupid fucking company still continues to do it because they're stupid. And you look at what they're doing with the freaking divas. Wasn't it a couple of months ago that everybody had their panties in a bunch and everybody was all in an uproar about what Paige said about Charlotte's dead brother? And I know it's not quite to the same level, but here, fast forward a couple of months, now all of a sudden, Bree's a baby face for whatever the fuck reason. You could say, oh, Nikki's injured and Daniel Bryan, oh, whatever. Who gives a shit? Just flip her just like that, because that's the type of stupid shit you do with the Divas division. And now Charlotte is knocking Brie and talking shit about Daniel Bryan, her husband, and freaking Nikki Bella. And it's just, oh, fart on this. I understand if this is going to be Brie Bella's, you know, one of her last pay-per-view matches, you want to give her a spotlight, fine, whatever. Daniel Bryan fans can be happy. Bella fans can be happy. I don't care. It doesn't mean that it's any fucking good and that I want to fucking see it. And then you've got the other diva shit with Team Bad. You've got freaking Becky Lynch. I still don't understand what the fuck Becky Lynch is wearing. Why the fuck does she wear that stupid shit? It makes her look like a jackass. Maybe I would, if you were in a more favorable light, maybe I would sit there and appreciate her a little bit more as a talent if she didn't come down to the ring looking like a psychotic bitch. And not in like a, a, a charming kind of hot, want a bone you type of psychotic bitch. Just looking fucking off the wall, stupid nuts. Maybe if you explain why she wore that shit, if you bothered to go into detail and actually, you know, build up that character a little bit and give some depth and meaning and story behind that character, maybe it would matter. But it doesn't here. 
And then you do this shit like they always do with the fucking Divas division. They book it in the most unrealistic female fashion imaginable. And here's what I mean before you just start screaming sexist, sexist, sexist. Wait until I say my piece for the next minute or so. Then you can go ahead and scream that in the comment section. I don't give a fuck. But let me get this straight. We're going to go with the whole enemy of my enemy is my friend type of logic. In what universe do fucking women live in that reality? So let me get this straight. Let me get this straight. Sasha Banks attacks Becky Lynch at the, what, the Royal Rumble. Now all of a sudden, because they're tag teaming together against Team Bad, they're buddies, they're pals, they're chums. Does that make any fucking sense? What women in your right fucking mind would actually act in that manner? And the women that might watch this video, the few that do, will know exactly what the hell I'm talking about. It's one thing if they have to come together to beat them up. These two should not be getting along. They should be fucking fighting each other. They should be bitching at each other. They should be clucking like hens at each other. It's just not realistic. It doesn't match the reality of the world that we live in day to day to have them sit there and all of a sudden now, oh, Sasha Banks is a face, as is Becky Lynch. Now they're friends because they've come together and this is just a bunch of dumb bullshit. Dumb shit. Oh, my goodness. And then we get to this, the whole thing of you had AJ right after the Royal Rumble. He just had to wrestle Chris Jericho right away for reasons that are still unbeknownst to me. Then this past week on SmackDown, he had to wrestle Chris Jericho again. This time we have to have Chris Jericho beat him, which is whatever. It balances things up. But now we get to the whole thing. you got AJ Styles versus The Miz. And for me, my opinion, this should have been the handshake feud for AJ Styles uh, off of the Royal Rumble. This is where it should have started for him. The Miz was a natural first opponent for him. You save Chris Jericho for WrestleMania. That's that special mid-card match that can mean something, especially because it's one of those things that's never happened before. What could happen? And frankly, because it's AJ Styles coming from TNA and all these other places, there's no guarantee that he would win at WrestleMania against Jericho, even though it's Jericho who loves the job, apparently. You can't say that because last year you would have thought, oh, they can't be stupid enough to put God over Sting. They put God over Sting! If they, did, if they had Sting lose his first WrestleMania match, what makes you think they wouldn't fucking do that with AJ Styles? But instead, we've already had multiple matches between these two. So after AJ's done wrestling The Miz, then he, he finally speaks and says something, and Jericho's like, eh, I, don't, I don't want to. Just, just what the fuck? So now we're going to have him wrestle at Fastlane anyways, even though Jericho said, I don't really want to. Now we're going to have him wrestle for a third time in a month. WWE could take something that could be really, really good and potentially special and have that inexplicable ability to just completely fucking ruin it and completely devalue it. It's just stunning to me. To me, The Miz would have been a nice, safe initial opponent for AJ Styles. Really, it would have helped get him over the right way with the WWE audience. And instead, The Miz is kind of a byproduct here. He's a plot device, and he shouldn't have been a plot device. If anything, if it was going to be a plot device, he should have been the plot device to take AJ Styles from the Royal Rumble to Fastlane to where he could have transitioned into Styles versus Jericho at WrestleMania 32. But the ultimate what the fuck of this week's show, and I think everybody's in agreement, who the fuck booked this main event? Holy Christ. And what makes it so bad is you're booking this main event featuring the big show, knowing that this is a big boy, this is a big man. Knowing that he's going to have to fucking go backstage to do his little podcast appearance with Stone Cold Steve Austin as soon as Raw goes off the air. Who in the fuck thought this was a good idea to take this big 7 foot 400 plus pound old man, put him in the ring, have to wrestle in the fucking main event just to sit there and have to hurry up and hustle his ass back to get on Austin's podcast. That's right, wrestlers do podcasts now. Who are the fucking marks here? Exactly. Who does that shit for me? <laughs> And poor anybody that had to sit there, including me, and had to watch this entire three plus hours in a man. The fact that it went way over three hours again. <laughs> Just to sit there and see a main event involving Ryback or whatever the fuck he was wearing. Big show. <laughs> Members of the Wyatt family and Kane coming out of the raw. Oh, Jesus Christ. What the fuck was this company doing this week? Oh my god. <laughs> if this was supposed to get somebody excited for Fast Lane, I don't know how they would expect that was going to happen. And I don't know what the fuck they were going for here. <laughs> you made a big show in the white. <laughs> oh, fuck it.
<laughs> Only the WW and the sad thing is that the people backstage were probably, yeah, that was awesome. This was good shit. <laughs> well, it was a good shit, all right. It was a good piece of shit. <laughs>